you know, can't figure out who, who gets the, the bid. Um, we've got to do our homework and make sure we're on top of that. So, uh, you know, that doesn't happen. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, you got to get the man. That's the one thing that I will say about the MEAC is that they figured it out. Uh, and But, see, last year it was so easy because it just came down to who was going to win, Central versus A&T, yeah. and Central ended up pulling it out. So, uh, last That's year. That's the other thing, too. I mean, you get a chance to win it on the field. I mean, yeah. you know, and that, that could solve all the problems if, if the winner of the conference would just beat everybody. <laughs> then you don't have to worry about it. There's no issue. Right. <laughs> You're right about that. Now, uh, this is the HBCU Report. Rob Calloway on the line with James Spady, head football coach of the Alabama A&M University Bulldogs in action uh, this weekend versus the University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. It is homecoming on the campus of Alabama A&M. And so uh, always, uh, always a good time up there on the hill. Uh, now, Coach, something else I want to talk to you about briefly. Um, last weekend, we had uh, the NFL making making their own statement, if you will, uh, and taking well, a why deep. Did I, why did I know you were going to go? Well, because, Coach, <laughs> you know you always give me – and to see, now, see, I talked to Coach Broadway already, and and that's what I was telling Coach. Like, you all bring so much perspective, you know, to the conversation, far more than I could bring. So so I have to ask because, you know, you all are generals of, of young men. You all are the gatekeepers, so to speak. So I know you got to have a thought about it. I do. I have a thought about it. I mean, you know, for me, first of all, we live in a we live in a country that that provides us with freedoms. Uh, I'm a I'm a military brat. My father was in the Air Force for 38 years, and he did he did do time in uh, Vietnam. You know, long before I was born. But anyway, um, you know, he fought for our freedom, and, and he'd have been the first one if he's listed. So he'd have been one of the first ones to tell you that um, I fought so that you could protest the way you see fit. And and uh, so I support that. If, if a person wants to peacefully dissent, I think it's your right as an American citizen to peacefully dissent. I, I've seen other uh, leaders who, who just t- who took a knee, who decided that, um, you know, this is not right and I've got to make a stand. And so I, I totally believe in that. I totally support that. I was fortunate enough to coach Colin Kaepernick uh, when I was at uh, Nevada, I wasn't the quarterback coach, but I was on staff there. And I know him personally. He, he is the salt of the earth. He's a, a wonderful human being. And I can tell you that none of that, taking the knee or anything like that, was disrespect for our flag, our country, or our Pledge of Allegiance, or, or in, anything like that. He was taking a knee in peaceful dissent. And and I because of something that he felt really strongly about, and I absolutely feel the same way. I think that uh, we live in a country that should protect everybody's rights, and and if I disagree with that, then I should have the right to say something. And um, so that that's my thing. Uh, I personally might not have taken a knee. Uh, maybe I'd have stayed in the locker room while the national anthem was going on. But it, he made a statement. I support that, and I think that somewhere down the road. Uh, the conversation is going to turn to what's important, and that is protecting everybody, uh, whether they're black, white, brown, polka dot. Yeah, absolutely. Before I let you go, man, so we got some news this week, Coach, some pretty sad news for some that the original playboy Hugh Hefner died at the age of 91. So I have to ask, uh, have there been some sad days in the the speedy man cave this weekend? Are your playboys flying at half staff? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I, I listen. I, I rest in peace. He 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 lived a, a, a heck of a life. Man, it was ninety one when he died. Right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, now we uh, say we, now we say women to stress us to death. But see, Hugh had a whole another outlook on it. So you just you keep him for three or four years, and then you just get a new one. You just re- get a new one and make sure they're twenty. Hey, I am I am not gonna co-sign that. Now, my wife might be listening. <laughs> so I'm not co-signing that. No it's, all, it is all good, man. <laughs> it's all good, Coach. Well, anyway, man, we wish you uh, wish you guys nothing but the best of luck uh, this weekend versus uh, Arkansas Pine Bluff. Uh, again, it's homecoming, and uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks. And I got a special message from Alabama State. They said, um, please help Coach Jenkins. <laughs> Whoa, whoa, I'm not messing with that one either. Hey, listen, Rod, thank you for the talk, man. <laughs> oh, look at you. Look at you just skirting around. I knew you'd do that. It's all good. It's all in the spirit of it. But <laughs> but we in some trouble down there, though. We in some trouble look like. But, um, yeah, man, so uh, we will talk to you in three weeks as we get ready for, for the Magic City Classic. 
So, um, right, so thank you so much, man. It was great talking to you. Oh, always, man, always. And uh, again, look forward to talking to you in a couple weeks. All right. Okay. The HBCU experience lives here. The HBCU report with Rob Calloway. We'll be right back. I heard on the news about that five-year-old who found his uncle's gun. The kid didn't know it was loaded. I heard on the news about that 14-year-old girl who was bullied online for like a year. She couldn't take it anymore, so she got her dad's gun from his nightstand. I heard on the news about that guy who broke into someone's house, stole a gun from the hall closet. He accidentally shot his cousin in the head. She killed herself. And later, killed the owner of the store he was trying to rob. If you own a gun, you have a full-time responsibility. When you aren't using it, be sure it can't get into the hands of curious children, troubled teenagers, a thief, or anyone else who might misuse it. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Remember, always lock it up. For more information on firearm storage safety, visit ncpc.org. This message brought to you by the National Crime Prevention Council, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and the Ad Council. Connecting the SWAC, the MEAC, SIAC, and the CIAA, the HBCU experience lives here. It's the HBCU Report with Bob Calloway. This is the HBCU Report being heard via the Two Live Stews radio network. Rob Calloway here with you. Uh, welcome to another Saturday edition of the show. Thank you guys for tuning in, however you may be listening. Uh, of course, uh, one of the biggest sports stories, not HBCU really, uh, but of course we tackled it all right here on the HBCU Report, was the whole Donald Trump thing that happened last Thursday. And we briefly talked about it uh, last Saturday, but we didn't know what the outcome was going to be. And we saw a lot of uh, protests from the the NFL team. Some teams decided not to come out on the field and take a knee. Some teams took a knee before the anthem then stood, Dallas Cowboys. Uh, But, you know, we saw a lot of things. And so uh, right now we're being joined by uh, one of the the great minds in the legal world, uh, talking about Robert Patillo. You've seen him on CNN. You've seen him on on Fox News Network. You can catch him uh, Sundays from 1 to 4 on News and Talk 1380 WAOK. People, Passion, and Politics is the show. Uh, Robert Patillo joins us. First of all, Attorney Patillo, thank you for joining us on the show. Oh, anytime, Rod. You know, you always got me. All right, man. So, uh, Donald Trump, NFL. Uh, g- just give me give me your thoughts on this from from a legal standpoint. All right. Well, well, there's two problems to it. One is what Trump was doing, and then two is what the protests were supposed to be doing. Absolutely. Trump knew. Yeah, Trump knew that he had a rough week coming up where health care was going to fail. His endorsed candidate for Senate was going to fail, and then he had other things coming out on the Russian investigation. What he has found is how to distract people from all those things by throwing out a, a social issue. If you remember the last time there was a health care vote on the skinny repeal, the day before Donald Trump was banning transgenders from the military, so everybody will concentrate on transgenders instead of concentrating on the fail of the health care repeal. So that's the reason Donald Trump did this. People try to treat, treat him like a crazy person, but he knows exactly what he's doing. He's been in media for 40 years and he knows how to control the news cycle so by launching this attack right before the health care vote he distracted the whole country from the health care vote for a week which was a brilliant strategy frankly but something that we shouldn't have fell for again with regards to the protests themselves what we are seeing is a whole lot of empty activism uh and that you know no one believes that jerry jones all of a sudden cares about police brutality against african-americans um, so when these players and these teams are coming out, they're calling them shows of unity, but unity around what? What are you un- unifying a- around? Are you unifying around the team, around the players? No one is coming forward with a clear agenda on how to actually fix the problem of African Americans getting shot by the police. Uh, we've even seen people in the Congressional Black Caucus, the different state legislatures and city councils around the country, quote-unquote, taking the knee but none of them are going inside the building where they're taking a knee and suggesting new laws that will protect individuals from being killed by police, which was the entire point of the protest in the first place. So I think the concept and idea of what we're protesting is for the most part been lost um, in the outrage and hysteria around the the, uh, the taking the knee uh, protest itself. Uh, you know, I was saying, that is almost like the ice bucket challenge. I mean, because you start seeing people taking yeah. pictures and posting pictures on social media with the hashtag take a knee. And um, and you're right. I mean, do you think that that this message can can 
uh, the the real message? Do you think it can be brought back into the forefront, or is it going to take Colin Kaepernick to actually, you know, come forward and and, and say some things, or or is it over? Is it just like commercialized well, well, now? Well, we got we have a very small amount of time left to try to weaponize this protest. Uh, it's become the new dab for this year. It's become the new oh, Macarena. No. Oh, that no. Whenever you know Hillary, Hillary Clinton was talking about taking the knee the other day. Whenever you have seventy year old white ladies start doing something that was created by black people in their twenties, that's usually when it's about to be out of style. But she is Bill Clinton's uh, wife. The, she is Bill Clinton's wife, for God's sake. So she might know a little something about that. But that's another story. <laughs> I was going to make a Monica joke, but I'm just going to leave that one on the table. <laughs> but, uh, but, but what I think is important is it's not the athlete's job to set public policy. The athlete, the entertainer, their job is to bring visibility, to bring uh, dramatization to the public policy aspect of it. It's the political leadership, the academic leadership, the civil rights leadership. It's their job to set the public policy parts of it. When James Brown says, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, he wasn't going to Congress to write the Civil Rights Bill in 1964. He was just bringing the attention to it. What we've confused now is we've we've conflated the people who uh, who are the public side of the issue for the people who are the policy side of the issue, and because of that, we don't get anywhere on policy issues. If you notice, when uh, when Donald Trump decided to uh, to repeal DACA to not allow the Dreamers to stay in the United States, what you saw was Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leadership, run over to the White House and they cut a deal with Trump within a day. And then it was just the law by the end of the week because they had a clear public policy initiative that they were trying to achieve, and they were willing to make sacrifices and compromises to achieve it. So when you say you support something, that's what legislative supporting something is. That's what an actual legislative agenda is. You go with a clear set of of, uh, goals. Then you use the public pressure to pressure those in power to compromise and bend to those goals. We're missing that second part of it. We're missing that policy side of it. So it's just a um, the majority in this country can treat it almost like a tantrum where, well, the people out there, they're angry, they're throwing a tantrum, uh, but let's just wait for the next Cardi B song to drop, and they'll forget all about it, and they'll go back home. And that's the way they're treating it right now. So until our political leadership steps up, we're not going to have any actual uh, progress on it. So it's not the job of the athletes to come forward and say, well, I've written this 150-page treatise on what needs to happen regarding police brutality. It's the political, academic, civil rights leadership's job to step up and actually offer solutions. Wow. Wow. You're absolutely right. This is the HBCU Report being heard via the Two Live Stews radio network. Rob Calloway being joined by attorney Robert Vitillo. People, Passion, and Politics is the show. You can catch him uh, Sunday afternoons worldwide uh, via uh, the radio.com app. Also, 1380 WAOK, WAOK.com, 1 to 4 p.m. Um, on Sundays. Uh, okay, so while, while we're talking about Donald Trump, I got to ask you, because I haven't talked to you about anything of any substance, because I have talked to you, but it hasn't been of any substance. Um, what are your thoughts on this? This whole H, the the presidents of the HBCUs going to get with Donald Trump uh, some months ago, and we've never heard anything else about it. There's no initiatives being passed. I mean, what's going on? Blame the Congressional Black Caucus for that. The Congressional Black Caucus is supposed to be our leadership in uh, in the Congress, fighting for our issues. The presidents of the HBCUs met with President Trump. They met with Omarosa, who was, was his liaison. President Trump recently appointed a new uh, director of his HBCU initiatives. The backstop to that is they did their part. So now, same thing with the cabinet protests. You have to have the political leadership in place to cut the deals needed to get the funding to the HBCUs. Remember, President Obama did nothing for HBCUs. He was probably one of the worst presidents for HBCUs in the, uh, uh, mm-hmm. that we've had in now the last well, you know, years. Now, you know they don't want to hear that, Patillo. You know they don't want to hear I, that. I, well, look, you can you can look up the letters that HBCU's presidents wrote to President Obama requesting additional funding um, and that he wouldn't send. He he asked them to demonstrate their value to him. He did not understand HBCU uh, culture, HBCU uh, value. He just saw us as more community colleges. And when he gave money to community colleges, he didn't give it to HBCUs. So it's the job of our legislative leaders um, to get in there 
negotiate, cut a deal, uh, and per se, because no one's going to give you anything if you're not offering anything in return. Um, the government, the president, they're not a charity. They're not just handing out money because it's a nice thing to do.